Welcome folks, this is a, the most requested video we've had with from my time with the Hasselblad X2D and that's to compare it to the Fuji GFX 100S. I can see why on paper they're pretty direct competitors, there's a lot of ways that they are similar and I can see why people would be comparing one against the other, whether or not they're actually looking to buy one or they're just wanting to do you know, that spec sheet comparison. But there are other ways where they're just not comparable and it's going to come down to your preferences. That said, I had this along with me for my full testing of the X2D, so we've done side-by-side -side testing. Let's jump in and I'll give you my thoughts. So we've come into the cultural center now, which is one of my favorite places to shoot, especially wide angle stuff. And it does highlight something. Now I have with me the 23 mil for Fuji. The widest I have for Hasselblad is 38. Now that's not ideal because you know, that ends up being about a 30 mil. I'd like wider than that but it is something you have to recognize. Generally between these two systems, what my notes were was that you're really limited with the Hasselblad because it's got leaf shutter that has the plus side of faster sync speed, but the downside is it's really hard to adapt lenses because you get warping. You actually can adapt some lenses on this and as long as it's a fairly stationary subject, I was getting nice results. But if you want a wide angle lens, you're going to have to really get a medium format one because they're not going to give you nearly the coverage for this sensor. The Cultural Center in Hong Kong is a great place to shoot if you like architecture or all of those Escher-like lines. There's a bunch of different things in there, museums and exhibition spaces. It's right near the Avenue of Stars, so if you ever come to Hong Kong, do check it out and it's worth having a little photo walk around the area. What do you think? I think this is pretty. What about this? You're a Fuji shooter, so these two are, they're still not directly comparable, but they have same resolution, same sensor. These are closest lenses you can get. What do you think out of the two? Just in terms of feel. This one. Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> this is more beautiful. Fair enough. To be honest, I think that's, the reason a lot of people prefer this one, just the aesthetics and how it feels in your hand and all of that, because on paper, the Fuji outguns it in so many ways. And I think on like the original one, the X1D Mark I and the Mark II, if you discounted the beauty and the ergonomics, there'd be no reason to consider it because it just wasn't as good as the Fuji and the other offerings in any way. But now it's a new day, as we've seen, they're much more close on in reality than they are on paper. I wanna do some studio test shots. So we've got Felicia in again, going to do the 55 mil and the 63 mil, bunch of different options here just to see how they are to work with. No tethering this time and give you sample files. So make sure you download those below and let's shoot. So it's a little thing, but you'll see in a moment having face and eye detect does make a difference. Just lean right forward to like your hand, put your hands out to your knee and like so lean your face down. So you can see how far she moved there. Okay, so here it's not seeing face or eye, but it's, it makes a big difference to be able to, and now sit up nice and straight. The face is actually, and shoulders back. The face is actually moving around a fair bit and I want the focus right on the eye. So having some kind of continuous focus and the ability for it to stick with the eye is really important. So look, I'm shooting here with the 55 and the 63. They're not the lenses I would typically shoot with. They both have longer, they both have a really fast 80 mil. Uh, Hasselblad is f1.9, but I couldn't get that in time to test out. Um, and Fuji have a 1.7. They also have over 100 mil options, but this is what I have. So let's get a, a nice tight shot here. So 
So look, honestly, it depends on what kind of studio shooting you're doing. If we're doing this as a direct head-to-head, -head, which is what I assume people are here for, if you're doing shoots like this where she's moving small amounts, there's no problem shooting with the Hasselblad. If she were doing jumps and hair flicks and moving from up and down and her face really moving around, then absolutely having face and tracking would be, well, at least face, I would be good as well. It's not flawless the eye autofocus, but it's definitely helpful. If you're interested in portraiture, folks, head on over to learn.artnudeportraiture.com and you can check out my latest downloadable course with Felicia, which is a candle wax photo shoot. This is intended for a mature audience and not suitable for work, but you can find the link in the description below. Now, there's a couple of big ways that these cameras are differentiated that's going to just come down to your personal preference. Now, I have to say, I'm a fan of Fuji's big dials, lots of accessible buttons. I think it's utilitarian and it just works great. Um, and this kind of really follows that line, like the X-T4 kind of series in their APS-C range. Getting the big sensor from its bigger brother into a smaller body, I think the body is so much nicer than the GFX 100. Um, it's a winner of a camera and at 6,000 US dollars, you're getting so much for your money. It's a magnesium alloy body. It feels quite nice, really nice ergonomic grip. Overall, a nice feeling camera. When you pick up the X2D, it is just different though. I acknowledged in the previous video, it is in a sense a luxury camera and I stand by that. But still, as well built as the Fuji's, when you compare these in the hand, the X2D is just on a different level of finishing and ergonomics. This is all aluminium rather than uh, mag alloy. The grip, even though it looks a lot simpler, is even more ergonomic. And the little things like the lens itself, the hoods, everything feels absolute top grade quality. Unlike the Fujifilm where lots of pieces are plastic and the buttons feel very run of the mill, everything on the Hasselblad kind of feels like it's been milled out of a single piece of aluminum or something to make each of the buttons. It just feels really, really nicely made. But some people are absolutely willing to pay for that how it feels in the hand experience and other people aren't. They only care about the results. And if you're in that camp, we can probably stop the video right now and say if it's just about the results, not about the experience of shooting or how it feels or how it looks, then the Fuji is probably the better option for you. It's cheaper, the lenses are much cheaper, it focuses better in the sense that it has continuous and face detect. Um, and the results are phenomenal and it's cheaper. So that's the way to go. If you love the design of the Hasselblad and those things do matter to you, then we have a real fighter on our hands because there's a lot that these guys have going on that are slightly different and are hard to compare. So we've come to Lagarde Road on the peak in Hong Kong. Maybe the haziest day of the year, but it's the only evening I had to get here for sunset. Got them here side by side, sturdy tripods, even though it turns out it looks like the Hasselblad, I could hand hold these at half a second. I'm gonna try and get comparable images. I don't have exactly the same lenses, but I'll try to use similar settings and a, you know, a timed release. I don't know how that's going to work. The Hasselblad had a release that went in by the microphone on the old versions. This now has no microphone port. So if you have that accessory, I guess you can't use it anymore. Whereas with the Fuji, you can quickly get in on the drive menu to adjust it into bracketing mode, but then you actually need to go into menu, shooting settings, auto exposure bracketing settings to then choose how many frames and how many shots you wanna do, and it's actually in a sub menu under that. So I'm sure you can, of course, map that to a custom button to get in there quickly, but you know, out of the box, they just, it's a two or three step process.
Now, I just can't help myself. I have to try out and see what I can do in terms of hand holding out here. I'm not gonna do crazy long exposures, but maybe I'll try and do half a second, one second and two second on both cameras and just see how they do. Now, these cameras both have five axis in-body image stabilization. The Fuji advertises six stops and the Hasselblad seven. On a high-res camera, to be honest, you'd be surprised if you found that good of a performance. But taking a look at these shots, the Fuji at half a second, one second, and two seconds, it's really not doing too badly. But the Hasselblad takes it to another level. Here at half a second, perfectly sharp. One second, pretty much there. And two seconds on the Hasselblad is probably as sharp or sharper than the Fuji was at half a second. So I'd say it's good for at least an additional two stops over the Fuji. With all of the new features that the X2D offers, if you're in the market for one of these, you're going to want to take the time to learn all of these features and set it up properly. You can check out my brand new comprehensive expert setup guide that shows you all of the controls, all of the options and the complete menu system on this camera and how to practically set it up for different kinds of usages. Link for that's in the description below. So shooting the same shot side by side here on the Fuji and the Hasselblad, two things just jumped out at me. One, practically in this situation, there's no difference in autofocus. Uh, there's no eyes to be captured and the speed is both perfectly adequate. And actually here I'm going from portrait to landscape orientation. I need to move my focus point. So on the Fuji, I'm using the rear nipple. On the Hasselblad, I'm using the bottom right corner of the screen as I set it up. Actually, the Hasselblad was quicker because I had to move a long way and the Fuji, as I've found so often on Fuji cameras, detects faces and eyes that aren't actually in the scene. So I was moving and then it thought it saw something so it jumped to there instead. But even just going in a straight line, you know, over more than half the frame, the Hasselblad is no slower than the Fuji. It's just an adjustment to have to use the screen instead of a nipple or a dedicated dial for that. Okay, so this could totally be a matte issue, but something I often find with Fuji's with the quick button and then the way you can, if you just keep hitting left or right inadvertently when you're walking around. On this one, I keep finding myself up at maximum ISO on things like X-Pro series and X-T5s with the four-way toggle. I always found it like setting custom white balance settings. It must be just where it bumps on my body, but quite annoying to set up a shot and then find, nope, that was at 50,000 ISO and garbage. There's a few ways that these cameras importantly vary in terms of specifications. Let's jump back in studio and talk them through. To start off, the Fuji is using dual uh, SD cards. This new guy has a one terabyte built-in SSD and it's using CF Express Type A as well. So, you know, there's significant money in the SSD potentially that's in there as well. The Hasselblad also has better and bigger rear screen and it's also got a much bigger magnification on the EVF. In fact, this has better EVF and rear screen than even the GFX100, which is $10,000. Comparing them, if you were to compare them against, say, full frame, something to keep in mind, the, they both have a, on paper, maximum shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second for mechanical but it gets a lot more complicated. The Fuji has a traditional in-body mechanical shutter as well as electronic. The Hasselblad also has electronic, but it uses an in-lens leaf shutter. If you're not familiar, a leaf shutter is a completely different design. It's literally the shutter is in the lens, not in the body, which means every different Hasselblad lens that you buy, they have to build a shutter mechanism into them, 
which pushes up the prices. And in this case, the lenses can be two to three times more expensive than Fuji. For example, say the Fuji 23 millimeter, that is $2,600, serious money. The Hasselblad 21 mil though is 3,750. And that's actually one of the smallest price differences being about 50% more expensive. The 45 mil Fuji is 1,600. Hasselblad has one at $2,700, but they do also have this guy, the P, which is only an F4 aperture and it's 1,100. So that's the rare case that Hasselblad has a cheaper option. More typical, if you look at the 80 mil portrait lenses, the Fuji is an F1.7 and that's $2,300. Again, a lot of money. The Hasselblad's is an f1.9 and it's $4,800, so more than twice as expensive. Zooms, Fuji have a 32 to 64 that's $2,400. Hasselblad have a 35 to 75 that's $5,100. So once you put together like a body and a four or five lens kit, that's where the real price difference is going to come into play. Now, the advantage of a leaf shutter is that you can sync your flash at any shutter speed, whereas the Fuji is limited mechanically to like 125th of a second, something like that. This will do all the way through to its sync speed. Now, I said they both have a theoretical maximum of 1 4,000th mechanical. Just keep in mind, if you were shooting with a fast lens on a bright day, that's probably not fast enough for you, but that's what they have. The Hasselblad, really, it's 1 2,000th of a second. All of the lenses, except for one that isn't for sale as I film this, the new 90mm that's in the new range of lenses, the V lenses, it will do up to 1 4,000th. All of the others have a maximum of 1 2,000th. So there, if you're shooting at f1.7 out, or 1.9, sorry, out in the bright sunlight, you're not going to have the shutter speed to get you to where you need to go. That leads nicely into the next point, which is that the X2D has a minimum ISO base of 64, the Fuji is 100. I think that's enough specs for now. Let's head back out and test them out in the field some more. Now there is no question that Fuji is ahead on autofocus and it is really helpful to have face and eye detect. But I wanna make it clear, it's not like you're shooting with a Sony A1 or something. Even once you have the face locked on, when you're shooting a burst of images, it regularly misses on fast moving objects, sometimes being just a few inches out, getting her body instead of the face, other times completely jumping to the background and missing the shot entirely. So whilst it's great for detecting the face and saving time with focus point selection, you're still going to need to limit the speed of the subjects you're shooting with and expect some missed frames. A couple of omissions on the Hasselblad. They took the GPS out. The Fuji doesn't have it either, but their previous generation from Hasselblad did have it. The Fuji will do 4K video up to 30 frames a second at a reasonable bit rate. The X2D has zero video. So if you need video, again, the con conversation and comparison is completely over. In terms of battery life, I think the Fuji has an edge, but it's hard for me to say exactly because I tended to be shooting 80% of my shots on the Hasselblad and 20% on the Fuji. So of course, the Hasselblad battery was running dead sooner. I would say overall though, the Hasselblad for a normal day of walk around shooting, one battery will probably get you done. I never got through more than one and a half, even on really, really heavy shooting days. I would say the Fuji one battery is going to pretty much get you through any day of shooting. 
except for that exceptional day. So for either of them, I would wanna have at least one spare battery if I was going on any kind of a trip. Startup time, the Hasselblad is much improved over previous generations, but the Fuji is still noticeably faster. And when it comes to autofocus, you just can't get away from it that Hasselblad, as I'm recording this, have no continuous autofocus, no face or eye detect. All you have is a single point that you can move around. You can make it two different sizes and that's it, single autofocus. So any moving subject is pretty much not going to work for you. Um, whereas the Fuji does have face and eye detect and it has a bunch of different modes for tracking and all of that good continuous stuff. Now the Fuji is for medium format world, you know, leading the pack. It's absolutely in front. But if you compare this to any other Fuji in the APS-C range, it's still well behind. And like all the Fujis, I find that it does find faces in landscapes and stuff that simply aren't there, which actually can be a little bit annoying when there's a face you want, that their hair falls over their face, and then it's grabbing some random pattern of branches in the background and trying to drag the focus there when instead of kind of staying with the person. So it's not as intelligent as other Fuji cameras, but definitely if you're going to be shooting moving subjects, again, the conversation's over, Fuji is the one to go for. So whenever you're out and you find a beautiful textured wall, try and <laughs> totally blur it out with your fast aperture. I've got both of the cameras now, and let's shoot a series at f 2.8, f4, and f8 at their base ISO and just compare the shots side by side. At F8 on the Hasselblad, I'm down at a 20th of a second. So as well as being optical image quality of the 55 versus the 63, we'll also be seeing the stabilization. So keen-eyed viewers or those who are interested in watches may have noticed that during this video I was wearing two different wristwatches. The reason for that is this guy, the Grand Seiko, is Japanese, less expensive but uber reliable and it nicely represents the Fuji. The Omega isn't Swedish but they also won't let you forget that they went to the moon and it kind of represents the Hasselblad. Now I'm gonna give you some sample files so you can compare these and see if there's a preference for you between them. We'll show a little slideshow of them here as well. Really, they're both fantastic to work with. The files are flexible and rich. They're both capable of 16-bit war. Um, it's just going to come down to, as I said, kind of at the outset, do you love the Hasselblad design more and are you willing to pay a significant premium for it? The stabilization on the Hasselblad is better. It has the built-in SSD. It has you know, a better EVF and a better rear screen, and in my opinion, better ergonomics and build quality. But is that worth over a two or three or four lens kit, almost double the price of what's already an expensive and quite well-built?